All right, the subject I'm going to preach on this morning is the, the subject of evidence of salvation. Evidence of salvation, something that I think uh, everybody has thought about uh, over the years, over time, when you've been, since you've been saved. And it's something I think is, is a pretty important concept to understand. When, if we want to determine whether or not somebody is saved, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we know or how can we tell if we think someone's saved or not? And there's a lot of different ideas that get thrown around there when it comes to the evidence of salvation. And a lot of people get confused about this, so hopefully this sermon will, will clear things up if you have any doubts about this. I know, you know, I've thought about this from time to time, plenty of people have. And let me just start off by saying, by saying this much. Because th this does boil down to the simplicity of the gospel. So my, my concerns about, about these things, if people get too hung up on this evidence of salvation stuff, is the, the, the number one problem that I have with, with a misunderstanding of this is making the gospel difficult or not easy to understand. Because the gospel is very, 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 very simple, right? In order for someone to be saved... They have to put their trust in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. It is easy. But the problem is that that is something that happens in your heart. It is something that is internal. The one thing that must be done in order for someone to be saved takes place inside. It is not the result of an outward manifestation. And as we'll see, the result of salvation may or may not include some outward manifestations. But I will say this, and we'll get into this a little bit more in depth. There is 100% an internal manifestation and an internal change from the moment that somebody gets saved. Don't deny that. Don't doubt that. Don't wonder about that. People who don't like what we believe and what I teach on this subject will try to say, oh, you don't believe in repentance or you don't believe, uh, here's a phrase, you don't believe in a gospel that changes. Yes, I do believe in a gospel that changes. But what the reason why people will say that is because I don't think that you have to turn from all of your sins to be saved and if someone catches you, drinking or smoking or doing some sin that maybe you used to do in the past, that that automatically means you're not saved. I don't believe that. I do believe that once you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born again. You become a spiritual child of God. That's a huge change. You've got a new man that wasn't there before. That's a big deal, okay? Very big deal. But that is internal. Now, it can manifest itself outwardly. Yes, and that's what we want, and that's what we want to see happen. That's called walking in the new man. But that doesn't always happen. Okay, and this is kind of just the, the high-level overview. We're going to dig into this, though, with Scripture, where I want to look at what the Bible says. I don't want to just tell you my understanding of this. Let's look and see what Scripture says. Yeah, but at the end of the day, if you're looking for evidence of salvation, you have to ask yourself, well, what makes a person saved versus unsaved? What is it? It's not works, right? So if we're going to look for evidence of salvation, it's kind of hard to say, well, your salvation isn't based on your works, so why would I look to your works for your salvation? You see what I'm saying? I mean, if it, if, if it was based on my works, then I could understand them. be like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, Hey, you're not doing this and you're not doing this. If that's how you need to be saved, then that's what I'm going to look to. And this ties in really closely with repentance, so we're going to go into that quite a bit as well. We started off in Matthew chapter 3 because this is one of the primary passages, I think, that people might turn to when it comes to looking for evidence of salvation, even desire and seek it. Now, I'm going to say, make one other statement before we get, continue into this. We do, I do, I mean, I, I imagine you do too, you probably want to try to judge or discern whether or not somebody is saved. I mean, we were literally just talking about this during the prayer time where we're saying, well, I, you know, I'm not sure if this person's saved. 
we're always trying to judge if we think someone's saved or not. Now, if we're doing that from the position of, well, if they're not saved, I want to give them the gospel, great. So here, when we get into this, if you think, well, man, I don't know. I mean, I'm seeing all these different things, and I think they might not be saved because of what I see. If your intent then is just to say, well, I mean, let's just give them the gospel then and make sure they understand and make sure it's clear, then great. I mean, it's kind of like there's not really a harm in that. The harm comes in, though, when, when you start, if it starts becoming this big issue and talking about like, well, this person does this and this person does this and this person does this, and I don't know if they're really saved because they're doing this and this person's doing that and this person's doing that. Well, hold on a second now. I mean, are, are you sinning? Because if you're talking about people's sins, and as I say, well, I don't know if they're saved because they're doing this sin or they're doing that sin or that, you know, be careful with that. Okay, now look, if, if you think that maybe they shouldn't be doing those things, I would agree. We'll get into that a little later. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's, let's jump into Matthew chapter 3 here because here we see John the Baptist. Okay, John the Baptist is preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist is doing a great ministry here. John the Baptist is baptizing people. Now, I believe he's baptizing new converts and existing converts. Because remember this, first of all, that baptism wasn't a thing prior to John the Baptist baptizing people. Like, this is brand new. This was not instituted in the Old Testament and the Levitical priesthood, things like that. It's not something that they did with believers until this point. So, every believer... No believer, I should say, had been baptized prior to this. So if you're hearing the preaching of John the Baptist and he's coming out with his baptism, I mean, if you were saved, put yourself back then in that time, you're saved, you're hearing his preaching, oh man, is the Spirit of God, is on this guy, he's teaching his baptism, his baptism apprentice, then guess what are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to go get baptized, man. Right? I mean, I, I, my, I personally did that. I took me, you know, it wasn't right after I got saved, it took me, Years, and then I was just like, you know what? No, I need to get baptized. I heard preaching. I'm like, no, I need to get baptized. It's really no different in one regard, except that nobody had been baptized um, prior to that. So just, just keep that in mind also when, we, when we're looking at John the Baptist and we're kind of looking at what he's doing there, that I, I believe it was both new and old converts that he was baptizing because they have to get baptized sometime. Uh, verse number five, let's look down Matthew 3, verse number five. The Bible says, then went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. There's a couple things that we're going to look into very a little bit deeper in this passage. The first one is understanding who is he talking to? He says, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. Because people say, oh, see right there, he's asking for evidence of salvation. He's asking for evidence of salvation. Okay, you know what? I ask for evidence of salvation before I baptize people too. Who, who here has been baptized personally by me in this room? Okay, do you recall me asking you if you know for sure that you're saved and why you're saved before I baptized you? I think everybody's nodding their head, yes. Yeah, why? Because I'm checking to make sure that you're saved before I baptize you. Now, when John the Baptist said, bring forth fruits, therefore, bring forth, therefore fruit, meet for repentance, the sentence doesn't end at verse eight. There's a colon at the end of that sentence, at the end of that phrase, I should say. Verse 9 says, and think not to say within yourselves, in their heart, we have Abraham to our father. So what's he saying? These people were trusting in their heritage. 
in their lineage that they are physical seed of Abraham and that's why they're saved and that's why they're the children of God and he's saying no no think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father God's able of these stones to raise up seed and Abraham that's not what it's all about you need to be born again it's what their belief is in their heart when he follows up bring forth fruits for repentance and think not to say within yourselves and don't believe this because that's false that's the fruit of repentance if you don't believe me turn if you would real quick keep your place here in Matthew 3 we're gonna flip over to Matthew 7 also but Acts chapter 19 real easily explains what John the Baptist was preaching because everyone gets called well John the Baptist preached for I mean, old-fashioned repentance you know what I'm talking about I mean he taught you got to turn from your sins and they repent or burn repent you gotta repent everybody and you hear these preachers preach like this right and it sounds great like yeah let's get this in you know what I'm all for fiery preaching getting sin out of your life hey repent of your sins amen but not for salvation Repent of your sins, yes, not to be saved. We ought to do that daily, okay? When John the Baptist was preaching about salvation and he was, you know, he was baptizing people with the baptism of repentance, it was not about giving up a sinful life to live for Christ. That was not his message. Now, People just use the word repent. Well, repent means to repent. No, it doesn't. Repent means to rethink. It means to change your mind. That's literally what the word means. It's not the way it's used commonly today, but that is what the word literally means, and that's definitely what the word means in the Bible. From a biblical definition of the word, that's what it means. Now, Acts 19, verse 4, the Bible says, then you know, the Apostle Paul in this chapter, he comes across a couple guys He's saying, hey, you know, they're like, hey, we're saved. You know, we've been baptized. Well, what about the Holy Ghost? What are you talking about, Holy Ghost? Like, they, we don't even know whether there be a Holy Ghost. Like, what are you talking about? What? How could you not know about the Holy Ghost? What were you baptized unto then, right? I mean, weren't you baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? And then it says in verse 4, so he's like, well, we were, we were baptized at John's baptism. So it's just like, oh, yeah, we're following John. John baptized us, whatever. Look. I don't think you understood what John was preaching. He explains it to him in verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. What was the baptism of repentance about? Believing on Christ Jesus. Amen. What is required for salvation? Believing on Christ Jesus. Amen. So what is the repentance needed before baptism? Believing on the Lord Christ Jesus. Just like it is in Acts chapter 8. Hey, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? What doth hinder me to be baptized? You got to believe. And then he, he says, you know what? I believe that Jesus Christ is the uh, Son of God. Great. All right, let's go get baptized then. This is the repentance. It's not... How much sorrow did you feel at your conversion? It's not how sinful were you before your conversion and now how righteous you are. And, you know, the people who get the most screwed up about this, I think, honestly, is at least those who have a, a, a sincere uh, misunderstanding of this or, 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 or are a little bit confused about this, in sincerity, are the ones who maybe did come from a life where they had a lot of sin, Okay. And because it's very personal to you, you might have lived a life with a lot of sin, right? Done a lot of bad things, had a lot of a, a bad, a, a bad history, like a long history of problems, right? Of sinful problems. And then you got saved and you know what? Maybe you, you did, you were thankful and you, and you, and you started to live right and started to go to church and you were, you were fired up and, and it was exciting and, and, and you actually changed your life. As a result of your salvation okay and I say praise the Lord for that and there's plenty of people who do that and that's the right thing that is right people ought to start living for God and doing what's right after they get saved absolutely 
But what you have to understand is that your personal experience in that specific way doesn't always manifest itself that way with every single person who believes. What happened to you at salvation, you became born again. The Holy Ghost resides within you and is going to help convince you and convict you of sins and help teach you and guide you in all truth. But you have to be open to listening to that too. See, you still have control over what you do. And that's the other important fact. We believe, if we truly believe in free will, you can't be looking at someone else's actions to determine whether or not they're saved because that person can choose to live a, a wicked life after receiving a free gift. Now, doesn't that just make sense logically? Anyways, hey, I'm going to give you a free gift. You just have to accept it. If this is free. Here's eternal life. I'm going to give it to you. Well, what an awesome gift. Now, should we be thankful? Of course we should be thankful. Should we praise God for that great gift? Absolutely we should. That's the right thing to do. But wouldn't it be possible for someone to accept a gift and then say, hey, thanks, and then still do wrong, still do bad? Yes, it's possible. Hi. Hi. My name is Pastor David Verzins. I'm an example of that. I am somebody who got saved and commit worse sins after I got saved than I did before I got saved. I am ashamed to say that. I am not proud of that one little bit. But it's the truth. Okay, and this is, it, it drives me crazy to hear people that want to say, oh, if you're doing this sin, if you're doing that sin, then you can't be saved. If you're, you know, you're drinking, you're fornicating, you, and you know the Bible says that? You know what? Yes, I did know that. I knew that drunkenness was a sin. I knew it. And I knew it after I was saved, and I did it anyways. Why? Because while the Spirit changes the flesh does not right. now I'll tell you this much as well because I know this personally what with salvation and, and the Bible teaches too I mean we know there is a change it is a gospel that changes there is a new creature that's born again inside of you the struggle is internal you could look on someone living a wicked life, living a life of sin. And this is the way sin is oftentimes anyways. They could appear like everything is just fine. Oh, look at them. They're having so much fun. Oh, their life is so great. Oh, you don't know what's going on inside. Yeah. And that goes for saved and unsaved alike. You don't know what's going on inside and in the heart of somebody who's involved in some wicked things that they're doing, right? I mean, this is why you see people who seemingly have it all and they could get whatever they want and do whatever they want and have whatever they want. They'll end up committing suicide. They go through multiple marriages. They end up just being addicted to drugs and alcohol and stuff like that and end up destroying their lives. Why? Because you don't see what's going on inside. And I would say the same thing for a person who's born again, a person who's saved. While you may look at that person and be like, man, that guy's just sinning and sinning and sinning. I don't even know if they're saved. You don't know what's going on on the inside. You don't know the conviction that might be going on the inside. Because here's the thing. The Bible says quench not the spirit. Now, do you think it would say that if it weren't possible to quench the spirit? Why would it say it? Like, quench not the spirit. But that's not possible anyways if you're saved. What? No. No. It says quench not the spirit because you can quench the spirit. And again, I could give firsthand testimony of, you know, the Holy Spirit trying to, to work in my life and me going, no, 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 and kind of putting a damper on that, that still small voice. <laughs> We're going to call it that. We were here for my sermon a week ago or whatever. Um, but, but, you know, quenching that spirit so you don't, you, don't, you don't have to deal with that as much. 
anymore and you, you, know, you could choose to strengthen your flesh and not walk in the spirit, that doesn't make a person unsaved. Now, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 7 because I'm going to deal with the other part of Matthew 3 where he said, first of all, he said, bring forth fruits, therefore fruits meet for repentance, and he follows that up with, and think not to say within yourselves. Right? So obviously he's talking about like, what they believed because the Pharisees weren't believing on Jesus Christ. They went down there to see what was going on, and he doesn't know if they're going down there and they want to be baptized or anything like that, but he's going like, hold on a minute. I know you guys, and I know what you believe, and I know what you teach. Now, that's the other thing is that these guys were Pharisees. They weren't just followers. They were teachers. Okay, These are the people who are going to bring forth proselytes and proselytize and teachers. They're not just a church member or a synagogue member, right? These are more the people who were instructing and the leaders. So he also says in verse 10, and now also the ax is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And I've gone over this many times in the past. I'm going to do it again. A fruit, an apple, an orange, any type of fruit that you have is not a tree. It's fruit, right? Very hard conceptually to, to, to grasp this concept. An apple is not going to bring forth other apples. If I had an apple sitting here, you're not just going to see like, whoop, wow, look, now we have two. It's not like if you pour a little water on it like a gremlin, it's just going to, you know, spout off and, and, and break into all these brand new things and reproduce that way. That's not how it works. See, that fruit needs to, it has a seed in it that needs to, the fruit needs to die. Seed goes into the earth, right? Then you get a tree from that. So what is it? It's dying to self, and then you're able to come a tree and bring forth new life. Then that tree, now that tree that was spawned from the apple seed, it's bringing forth apples. Is it going to bring forth an orange or a banana ever? No. Is it going uh, to bring forth just thorns and thistles? No. Is it going to bring forth good fruit? Similarly, the weeds and everything, those aren't just going to all of a sudden start bringing forth, hey, I, this is good for me now, I'm going to eat this. Like, no. That which is good brings forth that which is good. That which is bad brings forth that which is bad. Real simple. Real simple. Now, not everyone is a tree. Not every fruit is a tree. You know, a tree is a tree. A fruit is a fruit. Right? The tree has to come from, it's only going to produce what it came from. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus also explains this, and this is why John the Baptist is using this particular phrase to the Pharisees and Sadducees because they're the teachers. They're the trees, if you will. They're not just the general public. He's specifically talking to these trees and saying, look, the, the tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be hewn down. And Jesus says this in uh, Matthew 7, Verse number 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, again, this is on the inside. He's saying, look, on the outside they look fine, but on the inside they're ravening wolves. So how do we discern that? Because this is, again, going to the heart, going to the inside. Just like salvation. He's saying, well, he's saying to beware and then he says, you shall know them by their fruits in verse 16. Now, this doesn't say you're going to know everybody who's saved by their fruits. You're going to know the wolf in sheep's clothing by their fruits. It's specific. It's a false prophet. And the reason why is because they're trees. They're trees who are twice dead, plucked up by the roots, as it says in Jude. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 17, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So how can you discern a false prophet? 
How about you start talking to their converts, their fruit? What do you believe? What do you believe? Because here's, at the end of the day, how are you going to know whether or not someone's saved? You ask them. Yeah. What do you believe you have to do to be saved? It's, it's something that is determined from your heart. Well, the only way to understand what's in someone's heart is by what comes out of their mouth. By the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay. Now, obviously, there are other manifestations that you can have from someone who has a bad heart. They, you know, they, they do bad deeds and do a lot of other things. But the problem is that you don't always, with, with someone who's saved versus unsaved, you have the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. So the works of the flesh, anyone can do. But not everyone can do the works of the spirit. So leading someone else to Christ, being a tree that has that fruit, and wow, this person's saved. We're saved from this person. Yeah, this person led me to Christ. This person led Okay, now you can start looking at that fruit. And, you know, even the Apostle Paul, I don't want to get into this too deep, but he was, he was taught, turn if you would to um, Romans chapter 5. I'm going to spend the rest of the time in Romans. Um, he said to Timothy, make full proof of thy ministry. Right? Just make full proof. He's a tree. Like, make it, you know, his fruit's going to be good. He's going to be doing the good work. People are going to see that. And um, again, you know, it's not that the work is the evidence of your salvation, but if you're doing the works of a tree and reproducing, then it'll be evident the ministry that you have. Right? I mean, hopefully that makes sense to you. I don't know. I mean, it's, we're looking at evidence of salvation. We see over and over again what's happening on the inside. It has to do with, do they believe? Now, can someone lie to you? Yes, they can. Can someone say they believe something and not fully understand it, even though they think they understand it and they don't, and they can answer you the right answer but still not fully comprehend? Yes, that happens too. And because we, don't, we can't literally see a person's heart or their spiritual heart, we'll never know 100% for sure. But it, we got, Jesus has given us these rules, especially when it comes to teachers and prophets. Okay, look, if you see all these guys and none of these people are saved, what does that tell you about the prophet? And a lot of the false prophets are sneaky, you know, they're wolves, but they're trying to wear the sheep's clothing. And there's a lot of false prophets that if they know where you're coming from, they'll answer you according to what you want to hear. Yeah. You say, well, I asked this person, well, okay, they, they, they said that. What did you tell them first? Because a lot of times they'll say, well, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I say, well, that's what I believe too. <laughs> right? I mean, if you want to know a false prophet, you've got to ask them and don't let them know where you're coming from. Even the way you word questions, though, sometimes they'll think, oh, they're coming from this camp, so I'm going to answer them this way. Yeah. If you just come right off the bat to say, well, what do you think about repentance? More than likely, they're on our side if they're even asking about that. Now, some people may be asking about that that believe the other way, but I think more people are testing the waters based on what we believe. So there's, there's, there's indicators that people can get. Anyways, I don't want to go into the indicators a false prophet could get. Just know that you can't always trust. We can't always trust what people say anyways. But this is the, the bottom line of what we have to go to work off of. Now, are there other indicators? Yes, there are. And I'm going to cover that before we get into Romans. So the Bible teaches us that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Right? and that the things of God are spiritually discerned. So only people who are saved, who are born again, they have the blinders taken off their eyes when it comes to the things of God and understanding the word of God. So born again believers can understand God's word. It doesn't mean you understand everything and just you just have, I have total knowledge, I understand everything about the Bible. No, but you have the ability to now start to understand the things of God Whereas the natural man does not. I mean, they literally have blinders on, and they might stumble around and sometimes say things that are true and sometimes not, but they have no understanding of the Bible. So based on that fact, you may look at, if you're, if you're talking to someone, and someone might give you some of the right answers, 
another thing that I will use as a potential evidence for salvation, it still is based on what do you believe, okay? Because I've used this in the past. There's some, there's some, especially where I grew up in, Presbyterian faith. If you ask someone who's Presbyterian, you know, what does it take to be saved? They can say just faith by grace. And can you ever lose it? No. And oftentimes, those are the two questions we use. Say, well, you, they must be saved then, right? Salvation by grace, not of works. Can't lose it. Great. The problem is people can say that and still not be saved. What do you mean? Because they don't truly believe what they're saying is the bottom line. Because their understanding of the words that they're saying isn't the same understanding of what it actually means. And, and I know it's so simple, but these perversions and the teachings and the doctrines can do a lot of damage. It's one thing to just be taught, well, salvation is free, it's great, you know, but then in your heart, I mean, how many times have you talked to someone who said, oh, yeah, it's just by grace through faith. And then as you talk to them, they're telling you about all the good works you have to do. I mean, that should be evidence alone to, to persuade you of what I'm talking about here. People can say the right things, but that's not really what's in their heart. Right. Well, in, in the examples of well, what if a person does this? What if a person believes? Are they saved? They say, yes, great, but then what if they do this or this or this? After that, are they saved? Well, no. Well, wh why? Right? And you start asking these questions. That reveals more of what's in the heart of that person is when you start getting them to answer these questions. The other thing that I use, you know, obviously the, the asking, what do you believe? If someone's going to be honest with you, then that's going to be your best bet for understanding what's the evidence of salvation. What do they say? The other thing I've used, and this is more, more to do with people who I could talk to regularly, who can say the right answers, but I still just, something just doesn't seem right. And, and what the red flag would be, if you can like show people various different things in the Bible, it doesn't have to be these controversial things that are like, well, some people believe this way and some people believe that way, but at the end of the day, it's like, in, in their own regards, they're kind of true, but not necessarily for that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like real basic things that the Bible just clearly says, clearly teaches. If they could just time after time after time after time, look at the Bible, you show them this, well, what do you think about this? And they're just wrong every single time. What that shows me is that they don't seem to have any spiritual discernment at all. Yeah. Now, can I see their heart? No, but it's an indicator. Now, if I'm wrong about that and the person actually is saved, praise God that they're saved. But the whole point of trying to understand that is so that you don't stop giving the gospel to that person. Right? That should be our motivation in the first place of understanding what's the evidence of salvation. Well, I must need to tell the gospel to this person even more because I, I think they might not be saved. I mean, I'm showing them about Noah's flood. Do you believe that it was a worldwide flood? No. Well, look, here, the Bible says the waters went above the highest mountains, and it went up, you know, however many cubits above the highest mountains. The highest mountains, they had to go... Like, I mean, there's not an invisible barrier, right, that's, that's preventing the water from spilling over into the rest of the land around it. And if it went and, and rose, again, I don't remember how many cubits, three, five, ten, whatever, however many cubits, it, how many feet it went above the mountains. Once you get to the top of something, it's just going to roll over. It's not going to be like, wow, you've got you know, X feet of distance between the top of the water and the top of the mountain unless... There's water everywhere, right? And you show this to someone, they're like, yeah, no, I, I think it's just local. <laughs> okay, there's a strike against you, you know, like, and you start going through down the line of these things that are just real basic. I mean, Noah's flood, come on, really? Like, that's not controversial. The, the Bible just says this. Do you believe what the Bible says here? And if people are able to point to Scripture and be like, yeah, I don't believe that, no. And I've, I've run into people say, well, I believe Jesus but I don't believe everything in the Bible. Look, Jesus is the word of God. You are trusting the word to be your savior. Now, don't misconstrue that into saying, well, you have to believe everything in exactly the same way as me. No, but you have to accept like the whole Bible. You can't just be like, yeah, I just, 
I mean, that book of Leviticus, I don't like that book. I don't really believe that book. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. It, you you got you to gotta accept the word of God. Like You got to accept God's word as it stands. Now, you have different understandings about, well, punishments for today, maybe not. Whatever, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Evidence of salvation. Okay, let's look at Romans chapter 5. I'll, I'll get through this. We're going to look at Romans 5, 6, and 7. We're going to deal with just sin in a believer's life. And now that is not evidence of somebody not being saved. And I just want to nail this down, and we're going to close on this. Because this is so often what people want to look to. Well, I don't know if they're saved or not because of this sin, because of that sin. This cannot be used as that marker, as the measure to determine if someone's saved. Do they have sin in their life? Romans 5, verse 18 the Bible says, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, men, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the Bible teaches us here that where sin abounded, so like no matter how much sin there is, grace covers all of those sins. And, I mean, it doesn't matter how much a person sins, grace covers all of that. Does it cover this? Yep, covers that. Well, what if you sin, you know, 50 times every single day of your life? It covers it. What about 100 times? It covers it. What about, you know, 10,000 times a day? It covers it. it. No matter how much sin abounds, grace goes further. It just, it just covers that whole expanse of sin. That's the first concept. We've got to understand. If you understand that, first of all, well, just because this person's sinning and they're drinking and they're doing drugs, you know, like they say they're saved, but they're, well, you know what? First of all, grace can cover all, the, all that sin. It does cover all that sin. Now, we get to, and the wording is very specific and very important, and that's why you need to use a King James Bible because we do care about the individual words and what they actually mean. Chapter 6, verse number 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But notice what it's saying here. It says, shall we continue in sin? Basically, should we, right? Well, should we just, I mean, hey, if grace is going to abound, what this is saying, if grace is going to abound anyways, then why not? Let's just continue in sin because I'm covered by grace. Now, the statement is true. Am I covered by grace if I continue to abound in sin? Yes. But should I do that? God forbid. Of course I shouldn't do that. That's not right. That's not what God wants me to do. But is it the truth? Yes. Grace covers that. And, and as we go through this, you're going to notice should, shall, should, it's never saying, um, like, that it's going to happen for sure, right? Like, that it, it's something that we should do, but not something that is going to happen, just automatically, right? Uh, verse number two, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, look at this, should, should walk in newness of life. Should we walk in newness of life? Yes, we should. Does a person who's a believer after they get baptized automatically walk in newness of life? No, no. It's not something that just automatically, now if it were, you can say, well, they're not walking in newness of life, so they must not be saved. That would make sense if that were the case. If this didn't say we should walk in newness of life, then you might have a case for that. But it doesn't. It says we should. It means it's something you ought to do. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We shouldn't. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, 
Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, if he's telling you not to let it, let sin reign, let sin rule in your life, it sounds like you have the option to control whether or not I'm going to let sin rule in my life. So let me ask you this, if somebody does let sin rule in their life, does that mean they're unsaved? No. It just means they let sin rule in their life. They're, they're, they're walking in their flesh. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin. Again, yielding means allowing, just like let means allowing. It's another word. These are basically synonymous. Let, yield, you're allowing yourself. Don't let your members, which is your body, uh, as instruments of unrighteousness and sin. Don't allow yourself to do these things. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. If it were autumn, if it was just definitely going to happen, then all of this stuff wouldn't make sense. Well, the new, I mean, the new man's just definitely going to do this stuff. And if you don't do this stuff, then you're not saved. Um, you can't always say that. Now, now I'll, I'll go as far as to say this too, because I do believe this to be a fact. I think most people who get saved do do some are going to do some good things, and they do do good things. And, but, but here's the thing. You don't always see that. Most people don't even always see that. You can serve God and do things in ways that no one will, else will ever see either. You might only see one part of a person. You know, when I was saved and living in a sinful life, there were definitely times I would, like, read my Bible and pray and try to do what's right in the eyes of God and try to go to church and stuff, but none of my friends knew about that at all. They didn't see me going to church. I didn't talk about going to church. I didn't tell them about this stuff, but I did it, right? And, and that's what you need to keep in mind and understand that you, you don't always know what people are doing and what, you know, every, how they're spending every minute of their life. You might only see one aspect of that person. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Basically repeating what Romans 6, 1 said. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. And just as you did yield your body to uncleanness, now you should be yielding your body unto righteousness. Right? You, you walk this way, but look, you're new creatures, now walk this way. Now do what's right. Now walk in that righteousness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. You didn't have any righteousness, what that means. When you were the servants of sin, you weren't doing anything righteous. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And that is the end. Death is the end of, that is the ultimate fruit of sin. And the wicked false prophet, who doesn't have any good fruit, I mean, they bring forth death. That's why the Bible says, you know, you can pass, see it. Jesus said this to the Pharisees, you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. So you, what does that mean? You're already a child of hell, and now when you get a convert, because they're twice dead, because they can't bring forth good fruit, he says, you've made him now twofold more a child of hell than yourself. Children of the devil bring forth other children of the devil. Children of God are going to bring forth other children of God. Of course, uh, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Know ye not, brethren, uh, let's go, uh, chapter 7, let's keep reading here. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, 
how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Jump down to verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were, and we should, again, there's that word, we should bring forth fruit unto God. I, I, it's, it's in here so many times that I'm even missing how many times it's in here to point it out and be like, look, it says should. It's like, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Verses Acts 2 through 8, what, should we, what shall we do then? Well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, right? The Pentecostals like to look at it, well, what, what shall we do? Oh, well, you should believe, you should get baptized, you should walk in newness of life. Hey, you should do all those things, but that's not what must I do to be saved. What must I do, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. What should I do, you should believe, you should get baptized, you should go to church, you should pray, you should read your Bible, you should lead other people to Christ, you should get the sin out of your life. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yes, you should do all those things. But all those things don't make you saved. Not having those things doesn't make you unsaved either. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Someone has no works, but they have faith. How are you going to judge that person? Well, I don't see the evidence of salvation. Yeah, they're not doing any works, but the Bible says that they're still saved because they believe. Because it's not of works. Verse 5. Uh, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Again, we should. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. We say, basically what he's saying here is like, look, the law is good. Now, I didn't become a sinner until the law came, until I knew that there's a law. Once you know, hey, you can't do this, and then you break that law, now you're guilty, now you've transgressed, now you're a sinner, now you owe a debt because you've broken the law. But that doesn't make the law bad. Hey, the law is the law, the law is good, the law is just, the law is holy. Sin is the problem. There's, the problem isn't that there's laws and there's punishments for breaking the laws. That's not a problem. It's actually a good thing. I mean, do you want to just throw out all the laws of the country and just, yeah, anyone can do anything that they want. Does that sound like a good idea? Well, then, but then no one, no one would be in jail. We would have no prisoners. We, we'd have no lawbreakers, right? We could, we, could, we could tell the whole world, wow, not one person is is incarcerated here not one person is a bad person you could say like because no one no one's broken the law we, we have no criminals here our crime rate is zero i mean it, crime rate zero yeah because you have no laws the law is not bad the law is good right we, we want to know the crime rate because you know hopefully the the laws are reflective of things that are like god's laws that are righteous and true. Um, anyways, uh, he's explaining here, though, that the law is not bad, sin is bad, and sin is what's really, really bad, right? So, um, verse 14, driving home kind of the main point here. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I'm fleshly. The law is spiritual, the law is good, the law is righteous, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now, this is kind of worded a little bit confusing if you don't read it carefully. 
basically all he's saying here, and then he says in verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. The word would and will is what you want. So you read this with the understanding of what you want to do are not the things that you actually do, is what he's saying. That which I do. So the things I'm actually doing, I don't allow. What is he saying? He's sinning. What is he saying? Internally, because he's born again, internally because he's got the new man, he doesn't want to do sinful things. He wants to serve God. He doesn't want to bring forth fruit unto death by sinning. He wants to do what's right. But he's saying, but I don't do it. He's saying, I do the things that, I, that I'm saying I know I shouldn't do. For what I would, which is what I want, that do I not. I don't do the things I want to do. I mean, how many times would you say, like, man, I want to go soul winning, but then you don't actually go? Or even in your heart, like, every day you'd be like, you know, in that new man and new spirit, I want to lead more people to Christ. I want to do this. I want to read my Bible more. I want to pray. I want to do more. But then you don't actually do it. And then you find yourself just kind of, Maybe, maybe you find yourself laying around or just not doing anything. Why? That's not really what you want to do. It's what your flesh wants. But what you really want to do are these other things. And he's saying, like, man, I keep fighting. Like, look, I do the same thing. I catch myself all the time going, man, I'm not doing the things I really want to do. Why is that? Because we have the flesh. Now, Different people will have different degrees to which they're giving into their flesh, right? I mean, some people don't serve God at all. Some people serve God a little bit. Some people a little bit more. Some people a little bit more, right? And, and the more you're serving God, the less you're in the flesh because you can't walk both in the flesh and in the spirit. These two are contrary to one to the other. You're always in one or the other. You're not in the spirit, you're in the flesh. You're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. So, He's, he's, he's giving this whole, explaining this whole dilemma. I do that which I would not. I do the things I don't want to do. But if I do these things, I can send them. The, the law is still good. The law is still righteous, right? It's me that's doing these things, right? It's my flesh. He says, now then is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, look, this isn't a cop-out, but he's trying to explain a concept here. When he's saying the no more I that do it, he's talking about the new man. 1 John chapter 3 explains this perfectly. You know, that which is born of God cannot commit sin. And it's because, because it's born of, of incorruptible seed. And, and just understand that concept that who we are, we're, we consist of body, soul, and spirit. Right? And that new man, that new spirit, that doesn't sin. But you know what this flesh does? So when he's saying, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth with me, you know, kids, don't, be, don't say to your parents, well, hey, it's not me that, you know, threw the ball in the house and broke it. It's the sin that dwells in me that did that <laughs> after you said not to. That's not, it's not, it's not a, oh, okay, well, you're not going to get punished. Hey, the law is still there and the law is good, right? <laughs> you could say your sinful flesh made you do it. I get that, but there's still a punishment for it, right? Just like us, we're children of God. If we say, well, hey, God, it's not me. It's the sin in this body that's, well, you know, God's still going to be, okay, but I'm still going to, you know, lay the law down because I love you and, and help teach you to, to do the right thing. Um, but when you die, your flesh remains here. Your spirit continues on. You, uh, verse 18, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Nothing good is in the flesh. So if you're looking at someone that's walking in the flesh, are you going to see anything good? No, because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And this is what, again, the evidence of salvation. You see someone walking in their flesh. You can't use this as your metric. Because what he says here, for to will is present with me. So the difference between an unsaved person and the saved person, well, the unsaved person, they're not going to have that will to serve God that comes from the spirit. They're just going to have that flesh. So they're going to be walking in the flesh all the time. But someone who's born again, to will is present with that person. The ability to want to do what's right is there. But you can't see that from the outside because it's inside. You don't know the struggle. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. It's like I, I'm trying to figure out how to do what I want to do, and, and I'm having a hard time with it. I'm struggling. Right? I, can't, I can't figure out how to do it. 
For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I, I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not, as no more I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Let's bring up the inward man. I love the law of God. Inward man loves it. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Our sinful body brings forth death because the wages of sin is death, as he just said in the previous chapter. And he's saying, I just can't wait to not be in this body anymore. And you know what? I can't either. What a great day. Not just because of physical pains and problems, but like to be able to just serve God unadulterated, you know, with, without these fleshly desires just always distracting you and trying to pull you away from doing what's right and doing what's good. Because let's face it, when you're walking in the Spirit, you get the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, long-suffering, like all, these, all these great things that are just like, man, I love it. I mean, this morning, I, I was, you know, I, I just like, man, you know, I want to sing this morning. And when I was singing this morning, I was full of spirit. It was great. Like, I, I, I love that peace. I love that comfort. I love just praising the Lord and praising God and singing out. And man, that's awesome. But the flesh could keep you from maybe even wanting to come to church. But like, once you get there, man, you're, you're in the spirit. Things are going great. It's awesome. You love it. Just like you're going out soul winning. You might not want to go, but then you go out and it's like, man, this is great. How, I can't even believe that I didn't want to do this. Right? With all these things, you can say that, man, I can't believe that I was thinking about maybe not even coming. Well, things were getting difficult. I know. But, but then what would you have done? You would have wasted your time. You would have wasted your life. You would have slept or you would have watched TV or you would have played some game or you would have done something stupid and wasted your life instead of doing something that matters. Because that's what you're going to end up doing when you're just walking in the flesh. But just because someone walks in the flesh, just because they choose not to come to church, just because they choose to do some other sin, just because their flesh is strong and they're giving in to their flesh, doesn't make that person unsaved. It doesn't make them unsaved. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but the flesh law of sin. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. It's the last place they're going to turn. And I just want to make sure it's clear, clear, crystal clear. Because the worst thing that can happen when someone is a misunderstanding about this subject, about this doctrine, is that you muddy the clear gospel, that you frustrate the grace of God. I don't want people just going around, well, I mean, this person does this sin and that sin and this sin and that sin, and I don't think they're saved. Now, look. If someone's a sodomite, that's different. And I don't want to get into that old thing, the reprobate doctrine. If someone's a flaming homo, Romans 1 shows us that that's the evidence when they're burning and they're lost. That's the evidence that God has already given them over to a reprobate mind. That would be the exception to this when you're looking at someone's sin. But it's not because of their sin. What it is is that, is that that sin shows what's in their heart already, that they've already been given over to the reprobate mind. That's all that does is it shows that because they're doing these unnatural things. We have natural flesh, a natural man that is naturally inclined to sin, the sins that come naturally. But when you do sins against nature, even against our physical, sinful, fleshly nature, that is what demonstrates that you have been given over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, to do those things that are unnatural. You don't have to teach a child to steal. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to do all these, to fornicate. These sins come naturally. But the natural man is not attracted to the same gender. They're not going to just lie together like a man would lie with a woman. That doesn't happen naturally. It's a perversion, an unnatural thing. It's strange flesh. That would be the exception. When I'm talking about looking at the simple life, we're talking about natural sins here. 
Okay? Anyone who's, who's guilty of doing these natural sins, you can't say whether or not that person's saved because they're committing this and this and this and, you know, drunkenness, fornication, whatever, all these other sins. But you find somebody who's a child molester, sorry, they're given over to a reprobate mind. Sorry, not sorry. I mean, that's it. They're a child of the devil. Just as much as a false prophet is a child of the devil. And Jesus gave us some, some ideas on how to determine that. But, we're, you know, at the end of the day, none of these doctrines should ever muddy the gospel. And when you start looking at people and saying, oh, well, this person drinks, this person smokes, this person isn't coming to church. You know, I talked to them about it about 20 times and they still aren't coming to church. I don't know if they're really saved. Well, that doesn't mean, just because they're not coming to church doesn't mean they're not saved. I mean, that's what the haters are soul winning. Say, oh, you got this many people saved? Well, where are they then? Where are they all? Where are all these people you got saved? They're probably at home. <laughs> probably at home. Sleeping in, right? That's probably where they're at. If you want to know where they're at, that's probably where they're at. Just like the nine lepers that were that Jesus Christ cleansed from the leprosy, that never came back to Jesus. But I mean, you're tell you mean to tell me they were healed of that disease and they never went back to Jesus? Yes. Yeah, because that's what the Bible, that's exactly what happened. Only one guy went back to thank him. Well, if someone truly meant it in their heart and they were, you know, if they really got saved that they would come to church. Really? Are you saying that those lepers didn't really get cleansed? They didn't really get healed. Someone really got healed. Well, you know what? Those guys got healed. And they didn't go back to thank Jesus. It happens. It happens. I got saved. I didn't go back to thank Jesus for seven years. Now, maybe some of those lepers did go back to try to thank Jesus. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know. Maybe they didn't. Because I always say this, you know, I could have died before I went back to church. Because that's what other people try to tell you, well, eventually you got back, you know, because they, 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 they like to say this, well, eventually someone, you will. I mean, it may take a little bit of time, but eventually you will. Well, yeah, I mean, eventually, you know, he that begun a good work in you shall perform it, right? But if I die, then that performing is going to happen <laughs> when, I, when I get my new body, and, and then it will be performed, and that scripture will still come to pass because then I'll have my complete, redeemed body doing all good works. Galatians 2, verse 14. I'm going to close on this. I'm already over time. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Now, what's he saying here? If, we, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Like if, I, if, if you look at me and just say, well, you're a sinner. Is it Christ's fault? Is he the minister of sin? No, it's not. God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Right? Yes, I'm in sin. I'm going to make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live. So I'm crucified with Christ, but that's, you know, obviously not physically, because you're still alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And this is the key verse. 
I don't frustrate the grace of God. I don't make it complicated. I don't, I don't try, to, try to mix in any works because this is what was happening even with the Apostle Peter. You know, they're trying to go back to following these, these laws of, well, before you used to eat with the Gentiles, and now when these guys came, now you're not. Now you're going back to obeying their laws and their, you know, it's like, no, look, that's not right. That's not true. You're confusing these things. The Gentiles will look at you and go, I thought there is neither Jew nor Greek. What do you mean then? Now we can't eat together? I thought, I thought we're all one in Christ. What is it? And he's sending these mixed messages. Well, then what do we need to do? Well, what do, do, we need to, do we need to not eat things strangled? What do we need to do to be saved? Well, look, you need to do these things if you're already saved, but not to keep your salvation. It has nothing to do with salvation. You know, keep the, 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 the words of the law of Moses. Great. Yeah, because you're going to do well if you do those things. You keep these things, you should do well. But that's not what's required for salvation. And all throughout the scripture, we see people coming in in Galatia as people who, you know, preach another gospel, trying to add works, mix in works, mix in circumcision, mix in these other things. Look, don't frustrate the grace of God. And when people, when it comes to determining if they're saved or not, don't frustrate. Don't try to add the works going, well, I don't know, because you're not doing this work, you're not doing that work, you're not doing this work. You can't see all the work. You can't see what's in their heart. Ask them what they believe. Ask them. That is what's going to give you the best indication of the evidence of their salvation. What's coming out of their heart? And we just have to deal with some people lying to us, but you know what? That's ultimately it's going to be on them. I mean, they're going to be the ones burning in a lake of fire, not you. And I'll just say this. You say, yeah, but I might treat them different. Well, you know what? You shouldn't. I mean, if you, you let, me, let me put it this way. You, you shouldn't do it in a way that's going to impact you at all. Like, if, if, someone if someone in this room turns out to be just a total liar and they're just unsaved and they've been lying this whole time, telling me, oh, yeah, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, the way that I interact with that person wouldn't be any different. I'm not going to allow that person to watch my children whether or not I think they're saved. This is what I'm getting at, right? I'm not going to entrust that person with anything more regardless of what I think about their salvation. I'm going to have the same rules to protect my family with the knowledge that someone may be lying. Now, I care about everyone in this room. I don't, like, if someone's lying about it, I would love for that person to understand the gospel, if they don't understand it, right? If it's just a, a, an ignorance thing and they, they're, they're claiming to believe something, they don't believe it. Hey, I want, you to, I want you to be saved. And I would like to know if you don't believe the same thing so that I could try to persuade you. But at the end of the day, if someone's like that, they're going to be the ones going to hell, not me. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it might sound cold, but it's, that's, that's reality. And you, if you tell me you're a brother in Christ, I'm going to treat you as a brother in Christ. Amen. Which also means you're guilty of sins, 1 Corinthians 5. I'm going to treat you like a brother in Christ, and you're going to depart from me, right? And if you're not saved, I'd, you know, I wish you'd, you'd get saved. But anyways, let's not, uh, let, let's not get too deep on this, this um, looking for works to be saved and looking for this great conversion story and looking for all the sins coming out of their life because that's not what's going to tell you if someone's saved. Ask them what they believe. Get to the heart of the matter. It's the heart that matters. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you so much for your word and for the instruction that we receive. I pray that you would please help us to have good discernment. Uh, one, dear Lord, because we want to make sure that, that people are saved. If someone doesn't understand the gospel, I pray that you please help us to be able to explain it unto them in a way that they could understand so that they would get saved, dear Lord. And um, also, God, I pray that you would please just um, help us to... to understand more. We want, we want to grow. We want to reach people, dear Lord, and um, help to open up their understanding. I pray that you please help us to not make the gospel confusing or, or hard to understand because it's really simple. And uh, Lord, just use us to do your work. We love you. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.